The theme today, of course, is, um, um, is I, am, I am forgiven and I am redeemed. But as I was going over preparation for that, I realized that, okay, it's easy to say the words, but unless you have faith, that's not real. And then, of course, the, the events that have happened this week, um, actually, it seemed very appropriate to continue on preparing a sermon about faith. So let's read uh, the first 16 verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what was, uh, was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He couldn't be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they'd left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Knowing the truth of forgiveness and redemption is more than just a statement of fact. Truly knowing, truly having this inner understanding and knowledge without a shadow of a doubt begins with the sight of faith. But faith is often misunderstood and it's often misrepresented because in our attempts to simplify it so that we can explain it, We forget the radical effect that it's meant to have on our lives as the doorway to a relationship with God and a real understanding of participation in a divine nature. I've got it out again. You know, it was George Muller who said, Faith does not operate in the realms of the possible. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. And I love that. I think that's really got it. Hebrews 11 has got to be one of the most popular chapters in the Bible when it comes to talking about faith. It's a catalogue, isn't it, of of people in their faith. It's a faith hall of fame. And verses 1 to 6 are probably amongst the most quoted verses in the whole book. But we must remember the context of the letter. It was written to people from a Jewish background that were experiencing so much hassle because of their newfound faith that they were being tempted to go back to the old ways of Judaism. They were, in effect, in the process of losing their faith. And if you read the last two verses in the previous chapter, you see it becomes obvious that they were faltering. And the writer, whoever he or she was, now we don't know who it was, some people say Paul, some say Luke, we don't know. They're pulling no punches in reminding them that Christian believers are people of promise. And that it's impossible to survive spiritually unless you have faith. Unless you have that complete and utter trust in God that we long for 
but we often fail to practice. You see, faith is your first heading. Faith brings assurance. Faith is an anticipation of a certain future. None of us would ever invest anything unless we were certain in our heart that it was trustworthy. And I'm not just talking about the speculation of money. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, being certain of what we do not see. You know, it's easy to say those words, but it's not until you're on the point and you realise you could die any minute and you can say it, you realise just how liberating that is. I remember when uh, I was laying on the table and they were doing something in, in the heart, you know, and I was laying there like this, and I was laying in the shape of the cross. And as, uh, I remember I told you the story how the nurse pushed the, wheel, pushed the defibrillator with the squeaky, squeaky wheel towards me. <laughs> and I realised there was nothing. I said, stop. And they stopped said, what's the matter? I said, I just need you to know I'm not worried about the dying bit. All right. Let's not give my wife a shock today. There's this anticipation, isn't there, that God is going to do something. And although there's a fear barrier to get over, actually, God has got something more. And that anticipation should always in there in the back of our minds. So no matter how careful and how good stewards we are of our bodies, recognising that this body will fail and come to an end. But actually, as we get off that train, we cross the platform and go on to another one. Faith is the ability to look beyond the visible into the invisible. It's the ability to look beyond this momentary temporal scene and fix our focus on what we know to be true. And as we focus, we're enabled to live in harmony with that truth. And of course, that truth is the eternal truth of God. You see, faith is impossible without a proper perspective. And the eternal truth of God's promise of salvation, beyond our experience at this moment, is there to give us that proper perspective. So, for example... It's interesting that the writer to the Hebrews knew that the audience was from a Jewish background. Of course he did. And he understood that their understanding from an Old Testament background taught them that they would understand the things that they understood. So they knew, for example, that in Genesis 1, it says in the Hebrew, God the beginning created the heavens and the earth. We have in the beginning, but it's the same sort of thing. Okay. And it's very interesting that he opens up his argument about faith. And look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And here we have the grace of God again, meeting folk where they are, so that the teaching on faith is leading them back from doubting. And it gives them a framework within which they can understand it. You see how clever that is? That's not just a literary device, that. That is actually skill. And that's the insight of the spirit. Because the writer is saying, I am wanting to say Paul, but I'm not saying that. Okay, the writer is trying to get it across to them. Look, don't you get this? I know it's really, really hard for you at the moment. And I know people are giving you so much stick and saying, look, what's different? You might as well come back to keeping the law the way you used to. Forget this Jesus, who's not who he really says he is. And then he's, the, the writer's saying, but look. This is temporary. Look at the evidence that is there before you. Just look at the promises of God, but consider first how God created the heavens and the earth. And they went, ah, oh, yeah, I made that connection. This is no coincidence. And so it is with us if we look and listen hard enough. God meets us by his spirit just where we are so we can gain a godly perspective and live by the sight that comes by faith. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made of what was visible. It just happened. It wasn't a big bang. See, the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament recognize God's creative powers as the basis of their faith in his word. Their faith was based upon the fact that God spoke and the visible world was created out of invisible things. That's a remarkable statement to make, isn't it? Turn with me to Psalm 19, just quickly. Psalm 19, and we read the first eight verses together. Okay, Psalm 19, I'll read it. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. 
Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his, his pavilion. Oh, that's beautiful. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, the psalmist has got it. His faith is developed as he looks beyond what is seen. And his assurance in God's command came from his observation of the heavens. Now that is just beautiful. But do you see what's happening here? The reliability of God's perfect natural laws gives the psalmist the assurance he needs to trust God's spiritual laws as well. That is wonderful. The psalmist's understanding of God's reliability then gives him assurance to sustain his faith in a temporary world that is seen. Faith in God gives us the advantage to view our lives from the certainty of God's eternal perspective. So faith allows us to live in the view of eternity and allows us to live from the perspective of eternity as well. Now this is great because we can see our lives and our situations from God's point of view and we can do something about it. We can change our views. We can adapt our circumstances and by faith we can actually know that God is involved and interested in everything that we do. That's a lovely picture of a heavenly father. And it's all by faith. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 9. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. You see, faith evaluates the present in the light of eternity, giving us the courage to trust. It doesn't free us from living in our contemporary world. It doesn't lift us above the troubles of the world that we have, but it does bring us to a point of realisation that there is more to life than our temporal concerns, than our opinions and our choices. And the writer has given us a clear, clear message. If we, have to, if we were to have a firm conviction about things unseen, and we're talking about our relationship to Jesus, an understanding of the Trinity, and understanding the community that that expresses, and our worship, and our prayer, and our devotion, then we will begin to develop an understanding and a perspective that would enable us to enjoy our eternal life to the full right now. That's that special place I'm talking about. That place when you get to the point of realise, hang on, I'm going to die one day. But rather than being captive to the fear of that, understanding that actually your days are in God's hands and that he's involved here. He's interested here. Because once we trust Christ, we step into eternity. We start enjoying our eternal life. I've met so many miserable Christians in my life because they don't experience eternity. Oh, I'm all right now. I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Oh, but I don't want to die. You know, what's that all about? 10 out of 10 people die, you know. Comes as a bit of a shock then, doesn't it? But so many people see life differently. That's why they think we're weird. You know, little Johnny's grandfather, who never gave up an opportunity to pass on his sage advice to his grandson, put his hand on his head one day, and he said, be sure of this, Johnny. Fools are certain, but wise men hesitate. He said, are you sure, Grandad? He said, yeah, I'm absolutely certain. <laughs> See, this is the double standard that we live by without faith. Imagine for a moment Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, okay? Operating on that standard. Could you imagine? 
And I'm sure, you know, Moses had his moments. I'm sure there were times when he found it hard to believe. And there were times when he had to listen really hard to God and say, please, 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 just give me an answer. Because people were on his back all the time. That wasn't an easy job he had. There must have been those moments when all was quiet from heaven. You have to ask yourself a question. What did he do in those moments? I'll tell you something Moses did. He followed the last instruction and he got on with it. He got on with the mundane, ordinary duties of life. But he was able to endure because he could see the invisible and look beyond what he'd left behind. Have you got a problem there? Can't leave it behind you? Look at Hebrews 11 again, verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. There was no doubt in his heart. It wasn't just the plagues. It wasn't just the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. It wasn't just the parting of the Red Sea. All that stuff was there. What was important that Moses experienced God in his life and he couldn't doubt that. You've got to get to that point, Christian, where you cannot not believe anymore. Even though there are times when you doubt, you've got to get to that point. Look at Philippians chapter, chapter 3. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Well, let's read from verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this, says Paul. He's talking about no confidence in the flesh, trust in Christ. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, look, all that is a memory. Of course you're not going to get rid of your memories. Your memories make you what you are. But the fact is, I'm here now. And I can't hang on to that. I've got to move forward and I've got to trust God in this. See, faith sharpens our vision. If you look at back at Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 10, look at this. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him in the same prophet, promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundation, whose architect and builder is God. That was a promise. He could see God. And I wonder, you know, as we progress through life, just how we're coping with things in faith. I mean... Let me ask you, are you, how many of you will vote by faith in a general election? I know that many folk in the country won't bother for all kinds of reasons, but mainly because they don't think their vote will count. I remember seeing an interview of a guy on telly and he says, oh, well, he says, um, vote in my opinion, opinion, if it could actually change anything, it would be made illegal. I'm not sure of his uh, logic there. But I do recognise no hope when I see it and hopelessness, and an inward looking, and how people seem to collapse in on themselves. Have you ever noticed that? This man had no sight, really. He couldn't see beyond his own life and his circumstances, and so he felt the democratic process is pointless. And many people see life in exactly the same way. But faith, true faith, brings assurance, even in the face of hopelessness. And lastly, Faith requires attention to detail. See, the Hebrew Christians were forgetting their disciplines. And they were spiralling into an ignorance and unbelief. And this is so contemporary as we in today's church, with all our distractions, what we've done is actually sacrifice time with the Lord on the altar of our busyness and our own self-interest. Perceptively, the writer points out to the fact that God actually rewards those who trust him. Hebrews 11, 6, what does it say? And without faith it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Earnestly. Okay? You need him. Now we've got to make up our minds. 
And we've got to move on from the thinking that seems to pervade the Western Christian thinking that separates up our, our faith, our faith life and our everyday life. What we believe should have a full effect on how we live. And this is even more of an indictment here on the Hebrew, Hebrew Christians because their culture is one that sees life as a whole. Understanding that what we believe is linked to our behaviour because our faith actually indicates the people that we are. Now we covered this ground before. But it's important that we understand it, otherwise we're going to be trapped in this linear type thinking that depends on this logical progression. A goes to B goes to C equals Ds. And then what we do is we compartmentalise life experience and just pull it out when we need it. The Bible makes it clear that God will not initiate his plan of grace in our life until we seek him with a responsive faith. Turn with me quickly to, to um, Ephesians chapter... Chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So your faith is a gift as well, by the way. Not by work, so no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now more importantly for us to understand is that it's impossible to receive God's grace without a trusting faith. We prove our trust in our obedience to him. Look at verses 4 and 5 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. That you might shine like stars in the universe, Philippians 2. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life and so that, so that he did not experience death. He couldn't be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. See, Abel's faith resulted in offerings. His offerings spoke well of him. Enoch's faith caused his living to please God. Noah's faith moved him to build an ark. Abraham's faith moved him to wait on the promised seed, a son, even in his old age. And then Abraham's faith moved him on to actually offer that son as a sacrifice. By faith, Jacob blessed his sons before he died. By faith, Moses' parents hid him. By faith, the Israelites passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the Israelites marched round them for seven days. By faith, Rahab hid the spies. There's not one incident in this whole chapter that suggests that God's plan of grace throughout history did not require faith that moved men and women to obey him. Theologians now are talking about the risk of faith. I'm not sure it's a risk, you know. It feels like a risk, but what are your feelings going to do about it anyway? See, grace is a free gift from God to us. Our trusting faith and obedience is our proper response in thanksgiving to him. And I've read a lovely story this week about this Christian man great Christian preacher actually and he was sitting in a restaurant and uh, quite a busy restaurant and this man came up and said excuse me he said would you mind if I share your table he said no no he said, and just before his meal he bowed his head and said grace and as he opened his eyes this man turned around and says oh you're one of those are you and he goes yeah he said are you are you ill he says no he said uh, something wrong with the food he says no he said I was simply giving thanks to God oh I well, I want you to know, he said, I never give thanks. I earn my money by the sweat of my brow, and I don't give thanks to anybody when I eat. I just start straight on in. And a Christian man looked at him and said, yeah, you're just like my dog. He does that as well. <laughs> How are we distinguishable as a people of faith? Are we a people who see the purposes of God and respond in thanksgiving Oh, we just, we just plough on in as we want to and only call on him when we need him. See, faith is being sure of what we hope for. 
It's being certain of what we do not see. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Shall we pray? <coughs> we thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the gift of faith. And for the real promise that we have, if only we would trust you that bit more. Would you teach us this day just to understand what faith is, not just as a concept, but as part of our being. Help us to learn to give you our, your proper place in our life. And help us to be the children of God you want us to be. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen.